Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Friday. Jack was acutely aware that he had reached a stage in his life that offered no mercy. Saturday. Jack found himself sitting in the bath, crying. It wasn't because the water was too hot. He was severely depressed and didn't have a clue as to how he was going to drag himself out of it. It was the first time he had bathed and not showered for over 20 years, but here he was, sitting in his own deluded filth, the fingers of his right hand curled around the handle of the Stanley knife. The sudden breakdown was most likely brought on by Dean. Not a friend, exactly, but someone he had known for some time. Their paths crossed when their partners dragged them to the same social soirees that made them both feel even more at odds with the rest of humanity. It became apparent very quickly they were very alike. Superficially, they could just about pass for human beings with all the pleasantries and small talk. But inwardly, and if he was right about Dean too, they were both as volatile as a volcano and ready to spill out on everything around with an unstoppable eruption of suppressed emotion. It turned out he was right about Dean, and Dean's suicide last week hadn't surprised Jack at all. By all accounts, their lives had almost been identical. They were both married and lived in the same part of the country with similar professions and two kids. They were introverted, intelligent, and caught in the rat race, and admitted to each other they were engaging in a lifestyle set by other people's expectations. At 44 years of age, stuck in a dead-end job with a mortgage and two kids to put through college, he wondered where it all went wrong. A hundred or so years ago, he would already most likely be dead at his age, and just as he would have started thinking he'd had enough, he would have perished with impeccable timing, a great escape. On paper, he had a great life, but something was missing. He knew he had no right to feel that way, considering the world's struggles with illness and famine and so forth, and it wasn't that he was ungrateful, exactly, just not happy. He tried many times to reset himself but couldn't fake it. Depression, by all accounts, couldn't be cured, and today was a testament to that. Sunday Jack was out the door early. He liked to get out first thing, as there was less chance of seeing other people. He ran at least six kilometers daily, and often a lot more. Exercise for him was meditation, and he ran without music and to the soundtrack of the birds and the rustle of the trees in the breeze. He saw dozens of eagles as he ran on his favorite trail, and he imagined them looking down on him and mocking his spindly way of moving as they glided effortlessly across the sky. 
he wanted to be an eagle, jealous of their freedom to take off and fly far away. A few minutes into his run, and just as he had started to take in the surroundings of the open land either side of the railway track, there was a feeling of disappointment when he saw the distant figure running towards him. The closer the person got, the more it looked like Dean. But it couldn't be him, of course. He was found hanging from a tree in his back garden. With about 20 yards between them, he realized it was Dean and the dead man nonchalantly uttered, hi, as he ran by. The brief greeting did not surprise Jack. That would have been the norm for Dean. It was the fact that he had seemingly arisen from the grave. He shouted after him, but recalled the earphones. Jack stood there wondering if he had gone stark, raving mad, and the possibility crossed his mind that it might have been a hallucinatory vision brought on by his depression. The fact that he had called after Dean and put his lack of response down to him having earphones on and not the fact that he was dead was an alarm bell for him. He didn't finish his run. He went home to have breakfast with his family. He thought about telling his wife but decided against it and looked up depression again on the internet. Ironically, it was under his favorite saved searches it was some comfort to him that there was an abundance of credible sources offering various solutions and advice. On the other hand, the discovery that so many people in the world were depressed was like watching a news program that reported only the bad news. He clicked on depressive psychosis, but within minutes it had started to make him even more upset. So he refilled his coffee and went back to feeling invisible at the breakfast table. Both kids were on their iPads, and his wife was on the laptop. He wondered when it had become acceptable for such behavior to be an everyday occurrence, and if there was some correlation between the growing number of suicides and the lack of emotional connection brought on by people's attachment to their devices. He wondered a lot of things, but rarely reached any startling conclusions. Dad? Dad! His son Daniel shouted at him. Uh, yeah, what's up, Dan? I need a lift to Phil's house. Jack moved his leg to the side to get up from the table, but collapsed to the floor in a heap, his leg offering no support whatsoever, as though it was an invisible limb. He had moved it, and saw it move, but it was as though it wasn't there. Daniel laughed so hard he went red in the face, and Emily, his nine-year-old daughter, just looked at him and shook her head. His wife, Ruth, simply glanced up from her laptop and softly asked, Are you okay, Jack? He wanted to scream at the top of his lungs that he wasn't okay and to rip the tablecloth from the table. He wanted to pour water from the kettle all over the electronic devices at the table. But most of all, he wanted the ground to open up and swallow him whole. Fine, thanks, he replied. He dropped Daniel off at his friend's house and drove to the pier to stare at the water. It seemed like ten minutes to Jack, but when it started getting dark he realized he was sat watching the water for over two hours. Where to from here? He began beating the steering wheel, bit down on his lips so hard he drew blood. Next came the howl like a wild dog, and it felt good an animalistic reaction to conformity and all the chains that society had managed to lock him in over the years. He imagined them breaking as he transformed into a wild beast, a predator and not the prey. He screamed and pounded his fists at the dashboard and seat, and his spittle sprayed across the windscreen. The calm of the water did nothing to tame the beast that he was becoming. Jack was lost in the transformation long enough for the couple in the car pulled up next to him to quickly depart once they set eyes on the apparent lunatic, assumingly high on something and thrashing away to some obscure heavy metal track. Eventually he calmed. His heart rate dropped and he was Jack once again. Hair slightly ruffled and sore palms and lips, but he was back. No sign of the beast. Sunday P.M.
As he poured himself a whiskey, he thought back to the previous events and laughed to himself. The laughter soon turned into hysterics, and before long, he was in tears. "'What's so funny?' Ruth asked, smiling. "'Everything, Ruth, and nothing,' he replied. Ruth looked at him, frowned and smiled, and went back to her screen time. His phone on the table started to vibrate. He was due to travel down with his boss to an exhibition the next day, and no doubt Colin wanted to talk strategy. "'Colin can suck my... Are you going to answer that?' Ruth asked, frowning. Jack reached for it and watched his hand pass through the surface of the small table and through the phone. He tried again and the same thing happened. "'What the hell?' "'Ruth, watch this!' The table went clattering over and the phone skimmed across the wooden floor for a good ten yards before coming to rest near Ruth's feet. Impressive, Ruth scowled. Jack downed his whiskey and decided he would not be going to work tomorrow, as he was going slowly but surely psychotic. Ruth, he said, on the verge of spilling everything. What now? Are you going to throw the couch out the window? I'm going to bed, Jack announced resignedly. He sent a text to Colin explaining he was not feeling well and would not be fit for tomorrow. He undressed and put his pajamas on and walked into the bathroom. It wasn't until he saw down on the toilet that he suddenly realized he didn't catch his reflection in the mirror. Adamant he must have missed it, he slowly shuffled towards the mirror, covering his manhood with his hands. Oh, crap. Ruth, come here now! I have to finish this for tomorrow, Jack. Can't it wait? No, it most certainly cannot. Please, come here now! He heard her walking up the stairs, and when she was arrived outside the bathroom, he asked her if she could see his reflection. She looked towards the mirror, and then back at Jack, and then towards the mirror again. Jack, yes, I can see your reflection. What the hell's going on? He wanted to grab her and pull her close, to let himself sink into her embrace and nestle into the warmth of her neck, but thought he would most likely break down and start bawling like a baby. His pride prevented him from seeking such comfort. Pride. <laughs> the devil's sin, he thought. Instead, he looked back towards the mirror and some relief kicked in as he saw his frail, gray, wrinkly but visible reflection. Do you want me to run you a bath? Put some candles on? Hell no, he replied. I think I'll just read for a bit. Are you coming to bed? Jack switched the bedside light on and reached for his book. Again, his hand passed through the cover, and the same on the second attempt. Finally, on the third effort, he managed to grab the book. He considered the day's events, the Dean sighting, the breakfast table episode, his hand seemingly passing through solid objects, and the lack of reflection in the bathroom mirror. Something was happening to him. He had no idea what, but it had certainly got his attention. It all started after the bath on Saturday. He decided he was going to kill himself on Friday night when Ruth and the kids were visiting her mom. He was going to use a Stanley knife, and instead, he had sat there and blubbered. The thought did cross his mind that he might have actually done it and that he was already dead, and how that might explain seeing Dan on Saturday. It might even help explain the lack of reflection and the limbs that seemingly lost their molecular structure at times. I'm losing my bloody mind, Jack thought. He put his book down after reading three words and allowed himself to move in behind his wife and was glad he could feel her, the warmth, the presence, and the solidity. He drifted into a tormented sleep, waking up twice and checking his reflection both times. Monday. 
Jack was struggling to cope with the familiar Monday morning turmoil. He turned his attention to his daughter, a shining light in his otherwise dreary existence. Always singing and invariably smiling, he watched her brushing her hair and wrestling with the tangles, singing as usual and seemingly not a care in the world. How he wished that would always be the case for her. Ruth kissed him on the cheek and told him to get some rest. She also suggested booking an appointment to see the doctor before she left with the kids. It was the first time he had been left in the house on his own for some time, and he had a strange feeling that, at that moment in time, he was temporarily not part of anything, and that was perfectly fine with him. Within minutes, the emptiness and quiet gave way to the dark thoughts, and he decided he needed to get out. He would go for a long run. He looked at himself in the bathroom mirror, relieved to see the reflection, and splashed some water on his face before putting his running gear on. He managed to grab his shoes only on the second attempt, but didn't dwell on that. The morning mist was still lurking, and it created a stunning view over the fields as the sun did its bit to raise Monday morning morale. Jack settled in his pace quickly and took deep gulps of air as he took in the view and watched the rabbits duck and dive into their holes. And then Dean emerged into view, just visible over the next hillock. Jack felt a change in the air. It got chillier, and the sun no longer provided the warmth on his cheek. The light was fading quickly, as though the sun had decided against it that day after all. As Dean began to draw closer, Jack saw the makeshift noose around his neck. From a distance it had looked like a scarf, but he could see the swollen red line across his neck and the bloodshot eyes, inevitably brought on by asphyxiation. Don't fight it, Dean whispered softly as he ran by, and gave a smile as he tugged at his neck scarf. Jack carried on running. His pace accelerated, and his heart pumped faster. A bolt of lightning then struck the ground meters behind him, and the subsequent thunderous sound shook the ground and almost sent him off into the verge. He afforded himself a second to look up at the sky, and it had fast become an apocalyptic setting of darkness. Huge, foreboding clouds interspersed with bright orange volcanic swirls sent down lightning bolts towards him with sinister accuracy. He glanced behind and caught sight of a shape approaching in the distance. It was too dark to make out the form, but he heard an accompanying predatory growl. And that was enough for him to face forwards. He was already flat out and breathing hard, and his body was telling him to stop, but fear was propelling him onwards. Panic set in, and he turned his head again and saw the pursuer in more detail, part human and part animal, with a shiny black body and four muscly legs with hooves that were galloping as fast as a thoroughbred and beginning to close in. Its black pointed tail flicked viciously behind like a sleek leathery whip, and its red eyes were bearing down on him. Two large horns protruded from the top of its head, and they looked poised to strike. Jack's foot skimmed some of the foliage on the side of the path, and he stumbled but managed to catch his balance. He faced forward again and could feel his legs were close to giving out. A bolt of lightning barely missed him to the left, and he heard the ground sizzle. The thunder that followed was bone-shaking and worked its way through to his core. His heart began to beat so fast, as though it was trying to break free from the confines of his chest. As he looked down to the ground in front, he couldn't see his feet or legs. They were missing. He could feel his feet pounding on the ground, but they were no longer visible, and the disorientation almost sent him stumbling off the edge of the track once again. Meanwhile, the sound of the hooves on the ground behind him intensified. The odds were against him from the start, and he felt himself giving up and slowing down, and a fleeting sensation of relief swept over him as he prepared himself for the end. He stopped running, closed his eyes, and hoped it would be quick. Daddy, run! The voice in his head was his daughter's, and it surged through him like a spike of adrenaline. He opened his eyes 
and could see her, stood at the finishing line that had materialized in the distance, and she smiled and waved, and he waved back. Behind him, the beast had stopped its gallop and sauntered towards him. The battle won. Its giant paws silently patted the ground, and the tail flickered excitedly from side to side. The eyes glowed like red-hot stones, and a deep panting sound came from a mouth that unveiled four rows of pointed teeth on the lower jaw. A huge barbed and forked tongue protruded and slowly licked the air in front, as though it was tasting the fear. As Jack turned around to face the beast, he became immediately transfixed by the eyes. The orange glow and the rhythmic sway of the sleek, black body of the beast had a hypnotic effect that was almost comforting. Jack felt his heart rate slow. His gaze was still fixed entirely on the red eyes, but he could see in the background the tail rising upwards and the scorpion-like stinger that was being hoisted into the air. For a moment he was paralyzed, and then came the screams behind him. Run! He turned around and saw his family at the finishing line, and even Daniel was animated and screaming encouragement. Ruth was on her knees, crying. Run, Daddy! Emily screamed. Another shot of adrenaline poured through him and fired up his heart. The blood started pumping again, and he slowly moved his feet and started to back away. The tail was at full height and hovered above him, and it was ready to flick down at any moment. He ran. He kicked his legs and pumped his arms and could see his legs beneath him once again as he looked onwards toward the finish line. He felt the swish of the tail miss him by inches. There was a crowd of people gathered at the line. His entire family and friends that he had not seen for some time had come out of the woodwork to watch him race. They were screaming for him. A quick glance back, and he had widened the gap slightly. He found some extra speed and felt he could have glided across a lake at that moment. He knew hope was a dangerous word, but it was his lifeline now. Thirty yards separated them. Jack felt lighter and stronger, as though he was leaving every ounce of pain on that trail and all the baggage that had held him back for decades. He was about ten meters from the finish line and quickly glanced behind to find the dark predator was now even further back, tired and beaten. Before any relief could set in, and only yards from the line, Jack felt the pain in his shoulder. It started as a dull ache, but quickly surged across his entire upper body, as though someone was trying to rip him in half. He collapsed to the ground, clutching his chest as he felt an invisible force pressing on his ribcage. And as the darkness began to sweep over him, one thought popped into his head before he finally lost consciousness. That would have been a personal best. Monday, p.m. Jack! The voice came as though played in slow motion. Jack, can you hear me? He opened his eyes and saw his wife, Ruth, looking down at him, her eyes swollen with tears, but she smiled. He was in a hospital. He could hear the beep from the machines, and he looked at the end of the bed and saw Daniel and Emily. Hi, Dad! Daniel beamed, evidence of tears on his face. Emily was singing a rap song and gave a wave as though all were perfectly normal. You had a cardiac arrest, Ruth said. You're lucky to be alive, according to the doctor. I don't remember much. I was just running and I felt a pain. Someone on their bike found you on the edge of the old trail. Fortunately, you weren't far from the intersection and the ambulance arrived pretty quickly, the guy said. Jack reflected on the morning and realized he had every opportunity to let death take him. For some time, he had been letting the darkness in, and he felt his presence being slowly but surely erased. Death had been knocking at his door, and he nearly let it through. He saw the irony that he had almost died in his attempt to escape death. He had seen the other side and had one foot in it, so to speak. There was much to lose, and he wasn't ready to give up yet.
hope. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.